Hey, this is my second video log in sharing the progress that I'm making in writing the book Research at Scale, the Research Operations Handbook, which I'm planning on, on publishing in 2022 with Rosenfeld Media. Um, so I guess we're at a sweltering day in Sydney today, absolutely boiling um, to start out with. But uh, in terms of the book, where, where my progress is, is about two weeks ago, I submitted my first chapter. It's not the first chapter of the book, but it's my first chapter to my editor, Marta. And uh, a while ago, she had said to me that um, a chapter in a book is, in at least a book of the size, is around about 6,000 words. And I totally bust the budget and I wrote 16,000 words. This is the chapter on participant recruitment. And it is, a, you know, participant rec recruitment along with knowledge management really is one of the kind of key, big, chunky pieces of work that we do in research operations. And so a lot of the other things that we look after, like finances and procurement and capability and so on and so forth, these things very, very often will fold into supporting the work of either participant recruitment or knowledge management. So. I was really nervous because I figured, um, first of all, it's my first kind of big work that I'm submitting to her um, and as nervous she wouldn't like it. Um, but the second thing is that would she want me to chop this chapter down to 6,000 words because that would be torturous. That would really be a case of killing my darlings. I felt like everything in there was really important. Um, so we met last Friday and it was wonderful because she loved the chapter. She said she was very impressed with it. Um, it's, a, it's a good rough first draft. Um, but she also felt that there was nothing that needed to be cut in the chapter, that all the content in there was valuable, which was great. Um, and that instead what I should look at, do, at doing is, is um, and, uh, sort of, uh, dividing into three sections within one chapter, um, which is very, very exciting. So today I wanted to share um, a little bit of the thinking I've been doing about participant recruitment at scale and what we even mean by participant recruitment at scale. And then very briefly how that extrapolates um, in terms of operations. So I have a spreadsheet that I've been kind of um, playing with things in. And um, first of all, you know, what do we even mean by scale? It's a word that is thrown around a fair amount these days, certainly in the research op space and, and in you know, bigger research teams. And so for me, at least, um, research at scale means well, your scale could be pretty small. You could be here at one to five researchers. Or it could be really big and you could be at 300 to 600 plus researchers, which is probably less common than you might think. Um, I've got the term here PWDRs. Um, that's a term I coined a few years ago to really encompass all the kinds of people who you may or may not support in doing research in an organization. In some organizations, it's only researchers who um, uh, do research or are officially acknowledged as doing research. And in other organizations, lots of different types of people do research. So you might have researchers, designers, content designers, product managers, product marketing managers, and even engineers who are doing research. Hopefully they've been well trained in doing research and you might find as research operations that your job is to help them become better trained in, in how to do high quality research. But PWDRs really encompasses that full stretch. Um, there's a lot of thinking that, that I'm doing around um, and a lot of people in the space are doing around what is research even but that's a, a different vid video log otherwise I'll be here for 20 minutes um, so very briefly because I'm trying to keep these videos short um, I want to just do a quick view of what I've got here so um, if you're one to five people what does that mean in terms of the capabilities that you need to deliver to support participant recruitment um, in one to five, really it's like being an enthusiastic home chef. You might have your favorite baker, your favorite butcher, your favorite grocer down the road, a great collection of pots in the kitchen and a favorite recipe book. And it's not dissimilar when it comes to participant recruitment. You might have a couple of favorite agencies. Um, you might have a tool like one of the new self-serve platforms like user interviews, respondent or askable. Um, it'd be great to have a, a, a calendarizing tool like Calendly or You Can Book Me because um, that's a much better experience usually for um, participants and for the, the researcher. So all of this is depends. It depends on, you know, if you're trying to recruit um, people who have accessibility requirements, Calendly might not be such a great experience, or you can book me or any one of the other tools. I don't actually know at this point about their accessibility um, features. 
I could get myself in trouble there, so I'll move on. Um, you definitely, at any scale, you have to have an informed consent process and good data management protocols. But that pretty much at that kind of scale is probably going to look after you very well. Um, when you get a little bigger, say 6 to 30, at this point you might start to look at um, can we build an internal recruitment panel? And that's become significantly easier um, to like even six or seven years ago um, with tools like user interviews or respondent who have now the, cap the capability for you to build a panel within their tool um, that's very easy to use. Um, so you might start to think about that. Um, when you get to 31 to 50, this is where on top of all of that, you might start to think about bringing in um, training and guidance. Maybe you've got some written guidance um, and, and some training that enables people to understand how to do recruitment in the organization. What are your protocols? What are your etiquettes um, or, or your kind of behaviors that you, um, or your best practices, let's put it that way, um, that you'd like people to follow in doing recruitment in your organization. And some of this might include templates as well. That's not to say that you couldn't deliver those kinds of things earlier, but this is the, the time really where you start to feel that squeeze a little bit more. Um, certainly as research operations and often your researchers start to request that. As soon as you head up into kind of 50 to 100 and certainly in 100 and, and upwards, this is where um, the world starts to demand a lot more maturity from you um, in terms of participant recruitment. Um, this is where you have to start to build good relationships with the rest of the organization and also where your operations in terms of recruitment start to impact other parts of the organization. And so depending on your context and your size and the level of recruitment that you've got going on, you might have marketing coming and saying, hey, like our response rates are dropping because you keep reaching out to customers to take part in research. Um, but you also might want to partner with marketing to advertise people, you know, invite people to join your panel. And so those relationships start to become stronger. Um, certainly teams like privacy um, are looking at you and going, hang on a second, you're recruiting a lot of people. What's happening with all that data, and just in terms of the recruitment, but also like after the recruitment, when you've recorded videos and things like that. Um, certainly like anyone who's sending emails to customers um, or managing customer data might start to get in touch with you and say, hey, we've got a lot of people requesting data to do participant recruitment and I thought that was your job, why is it not being looked after? And so this is really where, in a sense, the organization starts to demand much more of maturity from you and where an isolated panel, um, although useful, might not quite be up to the job in terms of bringing the, the kind of scale of participants to um, the people doing research. Um, so that's kind of just briefly, you'll start to feel those things. And as you get into bigger and bigger, as in like these kinds of areas, into 300 to 600, those pressures on you and those demands become even more loud. Um, the sort of area that, that I work in with my team at Atlassian is 200 to 300. Um, we currently support around 250 people in um, doing participant recruitment. Um, I've been at Atlassian for about two and a half years, and so we're still developing our maturity, um, but these are the kinds of themes that are coming through strongly. So the second kind of big things to consider is um, how you deliver your services as research operations. And the first option is self-service. And just to say that these things are really on a continuum. It's not like either one or the other, but where you place yourself on the continuum. And so on the one end of the continuum is self-service, and the other end of the continuum is full service. Self-service is really where you as operations provide all the financing and tooling and the management of procurement and the management of the finances and the management of vendor relationships and compliance and so on and so forth. You manage all those relationships with the wider organization as well if you're working at those larger scales um, in supporting people doing their own recruitment. Um, and full service is really what it says it is, where you do as an in-house agency, you do the full service for um, uh, people who do research um, in that they submit a brief and you work with them to deliver participants to them. And I think one of the big things I learned early on and has spoken about a fair amount um, is that I learned that this takes a lot of resources to deliver and it's often wildly, wildly underestimated. And so in these lines, I really go through what do you need at the minimum, at the minimum, um, to deliver these kinds of things. And so um, looking at the level I'm at, I've got a team of six, including me, and we're able to mostly, um, well, we're able to do a very good job of covering the tools and capability needed um, to make progress in this area. But you know, give me another three people and I could do 
um, significantly more and, and really kind of keep privacy and marketing and email operations and everybody else um, a lot more happy. Um, um, but you know what, it's one of those things that uh, I'd, probably al I'd probably always be saying I could do more with more um, because that's how it tends to work. Um, but if I were to be delivering um, full service participant recruitment to the same number of people, I would need a team of around about 25 um, participant recruiters and then managers in there and then people at the property team of six still delivering on all the recruitment operations or the the yeah the recruitment operations needed to keep the pool ship going um, and so really instead of six people delivering support to 250 to 300 people I'd need a team of like 35 to 40 people to do the same um, which is is quite astonishing and I have heard of this being done um, in outside organizations and I have also heard that those have then those teams um, I, I know this for a fact in fact um, those teams have been um, pulled apart and it's it's been outsourced anyway um, so yeah it's it's really interesting when you start to look at all these dynamics and mechanisms for how you deliver and how you scale um, so uh, the only numbers that I'm keeping here in the hidden brackets here are um, numbers on how much all of this costs and it can get into the millions um, when you sit down and really work it out, it can, can be mind-boggling. But I'm hiding those because I want to you know, really check up on those and because they also take me a long while to explain um, another five minutes and I want to kind of try and keep this a bit short, short-ish. Um, so if you've got, um, what I've done is I did a, a, a very quick bit of research, kind of that kind of research, a little Twitter poll, um, and also have taken a lot of um, experience in working with researchers as to the average that, are, that a researcher might recruit within a month. And it tends to be kind of five to 20 people, as you can see here. Um, this was answered by 129 people. Um, and I know that's pretty standard within Atlassian too. And that tends, my experience is that tends to be the top line. That's what researchers tend to say, but when you look at the numbers, it tends to be a little bit less because of holidays and, and breaks in between projects or whatever else is going on. But you can take kind of a, an average of around about um, uh, 30 participants per quarter per researcher. So if you're looking after a team of one, two, five people, well, you have to find 150 participants um, per quarter, and you could look at a two to 5% resp response rate. And this is something else I'll kind of work into this table as well. Um, and so you're not just reaching out to 150 people, you could be reaching out to like uh, seven, 800 or 1,000 people. That's just sort of head calculation, so don't take that as, as a mathematical truth. And so 6 to 30 is 900 people, and then you can extrapolate that to that 2 to 5% response rate, depending on, on your, re your source for participants. Um, and so on and so forth, and this number grows to where when you're working at the levels that we are, it's at least 9,000 people a quarter. Um, and again, um, you're reaching out to significantly more, and then up to 18,000 people a quarter um, when you're working at even bigger scales. Um, so you can really see how this starts to really... Um, how things start to extrapolate across um, uh, across your work in the sense that if you've got 9,000 um, research sessions happening, you've got 9,000 consent forms to store somewhere. You've also then got the chance that of those 9,000 people, one of them will come back, which is sure to happen, uh, to ask that, that you, you stand up to a right, be, right to be forgotten and you delete their data, which means you need to manage all of that data proficiently enough that you can delete it. Um, it means you've got 9,000 videos to store, to archive, to figure out, uh, 9,000 reports to figure out where they, they go and all the insights that go with that and so on and so forth. And so this is where everything gets so much bigger um, and more complicated. And if you work in our space and you're geeky about it, um, more exciting as well. So I'm going to leave it there um, and hopefully that's been helpful. I'm going to try and do these video logs once a week. I took a bit of a break over the festive season. Um, but I'm going to make Monday my day to get this done. So see you later.